भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Live from Super Soul Farm. This is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host Raghunath and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York City, Kastuba Das. Welcome to our show. Welcome to our Shrimad Bhagavatam show. How about this one, Kastuba? This Bhagavat Purana, an appreciation for the Bhagavatam. Mm-hmm. This Bhagavat Purana is as brilliant as the sun, and it has arisen, arisen just after the departure of Lord Krishna to his abode accompanied by dharma and knowledge. Persons who have lost their vision due to the dense darkness of ignorance in the age of Kali shall get light from this Purana. Mm. That is the answer to one of the six questions asked by the sages in Naimisharanya. They asked, now that Krishna has left, where do we go for for shelter? Where do we seek shelter? In the Bhagavatam. So welcome, everybody. Welcome all our Zoom people. We have 97 people here this morning on Zoom. I don't know what's up with that. There's some people sleeping in today. They're just, they're just showing up a little late. They're, yeah, they're drifting. They're drifting in. Um, and if you're new to the show, welcome. This is a study of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the essence of bhakti yoga. People are trying, interested in um, trying to excavate their spiritual identity in this material world. They'll find not, not a lot, they'll not only find a lot of uh, uh, what did it say? Persons who have lost their vision due to the dense darkness of ignorance. Yeah, they will get some light from this uh, ancient GPS for the soul. Ah, there's a lot of there's a lot of roundabouts in the material world, round and round and round. It's like the samsara comes to life, silly choices again and again. You know, bad ideas again and again. Yet somehow if we get a little glimpse of the Bhagavatam, it gives us some access point out of the material world. And uh, I think that's why there's this strange, addictive little cult we have. Welcome to our cult, people. Mara, how are you? I'm good. Um, I got a letter from one of our listeners. Can I read it? Yeah, Mara. Who do you got? All right. Let's see. I really enjoy Wisdom of the Sages, truly. You're making the quite inaccessible Srimad Bhagavatam so light, funny, entertaining, and so serious at the same time. I cannot thank you enough. The first time I discovered Bhakti was shortly after Youth of Today's European tour in 89. I was just 13 years 1989. old. 1989. Yeah. I went to the lo- 31 years ago. <laughs> I went to the local temple for Sunday Prashadam and loved the out of this world feeling, particularly the food, at a time when the very word vegetarian was practically unknown in Norway, and being a vegetarian was quite hard in the normal world. I hung out regularly for a few years, learned to cook, cleaned floors, and ate lunch with the devotees every now and then. They even started calling me Bhakta Arne. I I really remember enjoying the company of the devotees. They were all such characters. I remember as a young teenager thinking that these were the coolest people ever, and they probably were. I never dove too deep into the text and the theology, and eventually I drifted away, slowly over time. But something always lingered. The copy of the Gita in my bookshelf that I flicked through once in a blue moon, the odd spin of a shelter record, the smell of incense in some random store, and picturing Krishna every now and then when I saw the color blue somewhere random remembering all the good stories from the temple days, seeing one of your photos, Raghu, from India. All of it stoking slightly, a feeling lingering there somewhere in the background. Then four years ago, one of my dearest friends died. He was the one who was the one who got me going on my first little dip into bhakti as a kid. Devastated and sort of quite randomly at the same time, I got a hold of a Tulsi necklace. I started wearing that as an armband. I don't even know if that's appropriate as a tribute to my friend and as some form of solace, reminding me of the hope that there's more, more to this world, this life and to death. I got that armband handed to me at my friend's funeral. Another friend had bought it for me in London. I remember it making me feel so strong and calm, even if it was then only resting in my suit pocket. 
Later, I got a proper Tulsi necklace around my neck. My material side, aren't they the coolest accessory ever? <laughs> they are. <laughs> I started reading the Gita a little more often or less seldom. I downloaded an audio version for long business trips, but still only a little dabbling. Then I got a copy of Ranmat Swami's famous book. Read it back to back, almost without pause. Then I heard a song sung by Kripa Moya Das, Jai Radha Madhava, by chance. And I was struck. It was such a strong version. I cannot describe the feeling, but it was kind of like the feeling you would get after a super long winter hike in the Arctic mountains, and you were welcomed into a warm house with warm and friendly people and food when you were about to collapse of fatigue. Combined with something I'd describe as relief from grief. What a song that is. Then, I discovered Wisdom of the Sages right at the end of the actual podcast, uh, right at the start of the actual podcast. I was hooked, so intensely hooked. I've heard every episode as one of the others pretty much daily. Sometimes when I miss a few, it gives me such joy knowing that I can listen to several episodes in a row. Hours of the stuff. Even when I'm critical or borderline dismissive, I'm drawn in, right back in, always. I missed out getting to know the Bhagavatam well in my first venture into bhakti. Thank you so much for giving this gift that Wisdom of the Sages is. Wow. Howdy, Bo. Welcome, Arne. He's here live today. Welcome. Okay. Arne from Norway. An elected politician. An elected... Uh, the Green Party in Oslo. In Oslo. Yeah. Welcome. It, you know what that... Do you think, uh, what do you think this whole idea of like this idea of you get hooked, Krishna hooks you, and then he just doesn't let you go. You want to explain that? Yeah, even you think that you've gotten away. <laughs> I'm out of here. I, I, Krishna thing's pretty cool, but uh, I've got my whole life here. You guys do it. I appreciate it. Go right ahead. You know, the way that I understand it is that if you come and you appreciate Krishna's devotees and you appreciate, you know, that's what he was saying, like the, the characters really struck him first, right? Meeting the people. Going to the ashram, there's always a bunch of colorful characters, that's for sure. And, and uh, even more than a, a phil on a philosophical level, it was like kind of an appreciation of the people. And, um, and then there was the aesthetic sense that stayed with him so that he was saying, you know, he would smell some incense in a store or, you know, hear one of your records or even, even just like seeing the color blue, you know. And, and they do have a name for it. I mean, on a higher, more esoteric level, you know, this is called Udipana, that there's these different things that remind you, different things that stimulate your remembrance of Krishna or stimulate your remembrance of your connection with Krishna in this case. And uh, those came back. And then I found it very interesting. He said this song sung by Kripamoy Das. That's actually Janavi's father. Right. You know, so we interviewed Janavi, uh, you know, a couple of weeks back. And uh, he's got a know, beautiful voice too. He's got a very beautiful voice. I, t I, rem I remember, I have a memory, you know. We used to go on these uh, Navadweep Mandal Prikramas. This, it was like a nine day um, walking. You would camp out for nine days and go to the nine islands of Navadweep, the holy places of Sri Chaitanya's pastimes. And you and I did that together. And you remember how it's really, we could, we could spend the whole day just talking about that. It was, just on such another level of experience. Materially speaking, it was like the most beautiful thing I've ever done. Yeah. Walking That's, through beautiful tropical jungles of, you know, Bengal. Which is incredible kirtans, incredible talks, incredible people, and incredible... It's almost worth just bottom. explaining that for a second. We, you have like 200 people walking through fields and jungles and villages, tropical, uh, you know, beautiful lush, you know, palm trees and... Uh, rice paddy fields and sugarcane fields and you're not carrying anything even though you're going for nine days there's a there's you know there, a truck takes all your stuff to the next destination spot but you're just chanting with these beautiful bengali singing the most sweetest kirtan and you're just walking through the jungle just singing and then uh you stop at some holy ancient holy place one of the senior monks tells the story of this place starts to interview the local priest they tell their story, they translate it for us, go to the next place. Then you show up in like a field or a, a schoolhouse or a, um, remember that time we slept at a sari where they made saris or something with like a, like a yeah, uh, yeah. 
a loom or something and they ha and they have a whole field and everything is set up for in the most incredible lunch you've ever had yeah and it was just like <laughs> and then they let you sleep a little lay down take a little nap and then walk on for the rest of the evening and then you go to your camp and they had these massive tents people would sleep under it me and costuba would just sleep under the stars I, they would have sometimes in the evening there'd be dramas just incredible dramas or, or kirtans i remember even then thinking like the material world is missing out on this this is like <laughs> totally. you know what you could pay you could, you could i was thinking you know what you could charge for this this is like an experience of a lifetime you can't you can't purchase a tour package for something like that it was I, remember, awesome. I just remember so many events. You said 200 because the first year that we went on, it was 200 people. Yeah. And then it got big. But the next year was 1,200 or, or more. I know. I like the 200 ones. But those 1,200 ones were incredible. Yeah. They were just because like all the, all the people that came on, there's just so many incredibly talented and wonderful people yeah. over there. I remember crossing the Jalungi River in boats. Everyone's yeah. packed on those boats and one of the boats sank. Oh, I, I missed that part. Yeah, well, I'm not <laughs> saying everything was completely No, safe. but actually, but the thing was, even the boat sank, everybody was happy. Everyone was just like, you know, coming out completely soaking wet and like, oh, you know. <laughs> and I remember then, you know, walking on, I forget where it was, but we got to the courtyard of some, um, some ancient temple. And uh, this kirtan was going on. It was just so beautiful, you know, it was mind blowing. And then someone climbed up in the, the big trees that were full of flowers and they started shaking the trees and the flowers were like raining down. And, and uh, I remember this time where I was serving my guru and I was like carrying his bags and always like right next to him. And we got to some place and, and he and his god brothers like were all lying there resting and Dravida Prabhu, who's someone that we really need to bring on as a guest. Yeah, you gotta get on the show too. So Dravida Prabhu is like a, um, it's hard to describe, but he, he, he memorizes and all these Sanskrit verses and, and he also composes them in English poetry and chants them very beautifully. So th th my, my guru and all his sannyasi god brothers are kind of like lying on the ground, just resting and just so happy to be in this holy place of Sri Chaitanya's pastimes. And then they said to Dravid, could you please chant us some verses that glorify Sri Chaitanya? And then spontaneously just starts pouring out the Sanskrit poetry and the translations. It just, it, like a, you know, like a, uh, with ease. And, and it was so, it was like living in Sri Chaitanya's Leela in his pastimes. The place and, was very beautiful. I mean, you can't, the aesthetics of the place was gorgeous. And... So it, it's hard to describe just how special those days were. Yeah. And so, but my memory about Kripamoy Prabhu, who's, who Arne mentioned in his, in his letter, was then one time at the end of the very last, the very end of it is then we went, you go from, you start at Sri Chaitanya's birthplace and you end at Sri Chaitanya's birthplace, which is just, you know, a, a 15 minute walk from our big temple in Mayapur. And then we went back to the big temple, which is massive, you know, like thousands of people can fit in there. And Kripamoy Prabhu was leading a kirtan. And everybody's like so spiritually surcharged after nine days of that just purest consciousness and you know mercy just like flowing. He was leading this kirtan with thousands of people. It was just growing and growing. And his voice is totally angelic and strong, you know? Angelic and strong. And I remember it was, and then you have murdungas, you know, the drums. And it was like, I don't know, you know, there's like a lot of drums around him because it was such a massive kirtan and it's like thunder, you know? And it was like, it was like you felt like the earth was shaking, you know. I, I can never forget that kirtan. You know? We're experiencing Kastuba's ecstasy right now, Mara. Oh, I mean, it, it, was, it was, you know, it was <laughs> special. So, but you can see that just by hearing his voice, you know, this is something when a kirtan singer really has true devotion. And, and they're, then it's not, what, who was it? Was it uh, Genevieve, <laughs> Genevieve herself, that we're talking about this definition of art by Tolstoy that when the artist has a particular emotion and then they share that through their song in this case. And when that same emotion is felt in the person that hears the song, then he would call that art. And when someone invests all their devotion, not just their skill, skill helps, is the vehicle to help carry that emotion. But when someone invests that emotion in the music, then when you hear that music, it's powerfully transformational. And, and this, 
this letter is a testament to that. Mm. How that song just reignited these powerful feelings and emotions in me and, uh, and uh, kind of awakened that, that spiritual life. But I, I really thank Arnie for that beautiful letter. That was, it was, you know, I've, I've, I always tell that story about how uh, Dina Bandhu Prabhu shared with me that name. We were outside a Bunky Bihari temple and Bunky means Krishna as the crooked one. And he's crooked in the way he stands. You know, Lord Ram stands very firm. Lord Vishnu stands very tall. But Krishna stands sort of with his hand on his hip and his hips to one side and his head a little tilted. He's crooked. And he's crooked because he's sort of a crooked thief and he has all these girlfriends and his eyes are crooked and his... And steal your heart. Steal, yeah, and that's what he said. Is he's also crooked like a fish hook. And a fish hook gets lodged in a fish and it can't get out of the fish because it's got that barb. So Krishna also gets lodged in the heart. And sometimes we don't even realize it, but if we approach Krishna in a mood of, mood of humility, in a mood of inquiry, in an honest inquiry, then, and, and we're just not nasty. If we can just let go of our nastiness for a moment and just be humbly approached, then the, the, the Krishna hook gets hooked in the heart. And then we might even think, okay, that was cool. That was a cool experiment. That was nice. And you go on your own way but there's something that will always be lodged in your heart. And, and anytime Krishna wants, he can just reel you back in. And it usually is a point where the mature, what ha what's happening is how I see it is we have faith in Maya. It's not like people don't have faith. When they say, oh, you get this weird faith, you religious people with your faith. Uh-uh, they have faith in Maya. They think that the material world will give them what their heart wants. And that is an illusion. That is just not what, that's just not, it's not true. Well, they think, oh, I gotta find the perfect romance. I'll find the perfect, I'll go to that perfect place. I'll get the perfect gig, the perfect career, or my band will get so big, whatever it is. We want, we, we're, it's like we're running fast to red lights. And, um, and then that hook is there. And you're like, what is my shelter in this world? And then that's when Krishna gets you, when you sort of just like give up on the material world and Krishna starts <laughs> reeling you in. <laughs> Welcome back to Arne. <laughs> Welcome back to Arne. You know, I see that Parmananda is sharing on the chat board that he, he remembers. Now that Kirtan was like nearly 30 years ago. <laughs> I can't remember it. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you may not have been there because it was several years that we did it. But uh, he says, I'll never forget that Kirtan. He started with Hari Hari Namaha. It was incredible. I, yeah, I, it was mind blowing. Yeah, there are kirtans, and those are the things that sort of stay with you, and they and they leave those impressions. It's the kirtan, it's the smells, the sounds, the taste, and also this important thing he said: the way people treat you. Like when you meet pe person practicing bhakti, they've got no ego. I remember our good friend uh, Sachi Sutta, who was on the show. He said, uh, we were on tour with our band before we were just getting into Bhakti. This was also 1988. And we went to the, we drove straight down to the Miami temple on a tour. And I wanted to stay at the temple. We had three days off in Miami. And um, I was talking to, and, and he didn't know much about Krishna at all. And I was talking about Krishna on the way down. And after the tour, I was going to, you know, go to India. And, uh, I, and just not that long ago, I asked him, well, what was it that sort of like got you into it? And he said, you know, we went to Miami and I met Dravida, the person you were just talking about reciting yeah. all those prayers. And when I met him, I realized like I'm doing everything wrong with my life. You're not supposed to be mean. You're supposed to be like him. I guess he <laughs> felt like he sort of like, he felt he was mean or something, but he goes, I just felt like this is the way you're supposed to be in the world. So when you meet a person who embodies that bhakti, you're just like, oh, it's almost like it resets your compass. It recalibrates the GPS. Recalibrating, recalibrating. <laughs> you're on pause. Come on, recalibrate. I got need to know my direction. Mara? Yeah, she's like, yeah. Nod. she's nodding for all those people who are not looking at. <laughs> John Atai is saying that he was at that kirtan too and he can't forget it also. All right. There you go. All right. We're man. all hooked. Nothing we can do about it. <sighs> all right. Well, let's dive into the Srimad Bhagavatam, sir.
All right. Start with this prayer. Narayanam namaskritya, naram chayva narotamam, evim sarasvatim vyasam tatojayam mudiraye. Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the very means of conquest, one should offer respectful obeisances to the personality of Godhead Narayan, unto Nara Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and to Srila Vyasadev, the author. Nasta prayeshva badreshu nityam bhagavat sevaya, bhagavati uttama shloke bhaktir bhavati naishtiki. By regular attendance in classes on the Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed. And loving service to the personality of Godhead, who is praised with transcendental songs, is established as an irrevocable fact. Om Jnana Tamarandasya Yananjana Sulakaya Chakshurun Madatam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. He was binge listening. He missed an episode. Arne was miss, missing an episode and he binge listened. Isn't it great? You can binge the Bhagavatam now. That is the power of YouTube, of uh, things where you can get rec- audible, where you can get recordings or lectures. You can just binge listen. You can go for a bike ride and listen. You can have that information in your... The interesting thing is so many things are vying for your attention in the material world. So many things read me, watch me. I have a whole list of books I'm supposed to be reading that I don't want to read, but I should be reading. They're all like that to do with like material skills and things like that. I just won't want to read them. There's a bunch of like important documentaries I don't want, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm supposed to re- watch. I think it'll be good for me. I don't want to see them. <laughs> it's just like, I don't want to. They're all vying for my ear space. You got to keep that ear space sacred. I'm with you, Raghav. You're hooked too. You sound like you're hooked. <laughs> Trying to be hooked. You get hooked by uh, just keep on being hooked. That's how you get hooked. All right. Okay. We start a new chapter today. Do you know that? Are you aware of that, Raghav? Um, I think, you know, we were talking and, uh, <laughs> and then a chapter ended. And a chapter ended. You can, you're able to pull it up? We're on chapter 11 now. You look lost. You look like you're... you're I'm looking lost. I know. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think I pulled up uh, the wrong page. Can you, can you start? I'll find it. Yeah. Well, you know, let's start with a little, uh, a little check-in here, right? We just ended a chapter where Krishna left Hastinapur. So he was in one place with the Pandavas, and all of the people there are watching him go. And the ladies on the roofs had very important things to say. And we heard what they said. And they are at that moment being immersed in the spiritual taste, the spiritual experience called separation, right? And separation means like when you feel a certain type of separation when it's about to happen mm-hmm. and you feel an even more intense feeling of separation when it's happening, right? At that very moment when the separation is happening and then you feel a feeling of separation after the person is gone. And so we heard from them as that separation was setting in. And now we're going to the other side, to Dwarka, where Krishna is arriving. And so there, all the people there are going to be immersed in the other feeling, the feeling of union, right? Reunion in this case. So there's there's, uh, Vipralamba, Sanskrit word meaning the feeling of separation. And then there's some bhoga, the feeling of union. And you, of course, remember that great saintly person, uh, Gaur Govinda Maharaj. Yeah. Right? yeah. Right. He was a sannyasi. He passed away back, I think it was 96 that he passed away. Yeah. Um, he, was, uh, he was from Orissa. And he was just an incredible speaker on Bhagavatam. He's one of these incredible people who just grew up from childhood reading the Bhagavatam. Yeah. I think it was from a big family. Big family fa- father read the Bhagavatam. And he's sort of like in the, in, the, in the very beginning stages of the Krishna movement. He was sort of like wandering around Vrindavan and he met Prabhupada. And he was 50 years old or in his 50s and sort of like retiring. He was like retiring to Vrindavan to live as a monk. 
and um, uh, he met Prabhupada and Prabhupada immediately recognized him and gave him first initiation, second initiation and sannyas initiation in one, in one go. Wow. The guy was, in, he, he was incredibly powerful speaker. And it was just like, he was one of those persons you open your mouth and flowing out of his mouth. And he was incredibly charming, um, incredible singer. And he had this, and it was a, in a dynamic speaker. Like sometimes he'd be in class and he would talk very softly. So you, <laughs> <Right? laughs> he would call, you call Stuba. <laughs> that was part of his thing. He would, he would also, he, he would have a Murdunga player there because when he would quote a verse, he wouldn't just say it, he would sing it. And then as soon as he would start singing it, the Murdunga player would start playing and he would start singing. It was like a, it was, it was a real cultural experience just to hear him give class i'm going to put his name up on the yeah. uh, on the chat board Gaur um, Govinda Swami. Talking. So and um i got a youtube video and uh but he was very expert at, at understanding and being able to explain these esoteric ideas of bhakti from the bhagavatam and, and the other thing that he would do is he would always like someone that was sitting near him that was listening he would choose that person just to be the, he's the guy that's going to get it. <laughs> yeah. And the whole class, he'd be quizzing that person. And if they didn't get the question right, he'd be on their case and he'd be, you know, in a, it was, it was, oh, you're a, <laughs> it, was the, it was sweet, but it could actually be quite intense too. Yeah. Are you a teacher? Are you a cheater? You know, Are you a teacher like, or a cheater? You come up, puck on my schnapp. What's that? You know, like he would just be like, he would get on that person's case. It was very charming though. Cause he was yeah. an older man and he could get, you know, he could do that. And, uh, and so, but it was also a way of teaching and it was a way of making it all sink into your head. Just that whole, the way that he played the whole thing out was it was a very effective teaching platform. But, but the reason I brought up his name was because he could explain these esoteric ideas very well. And he wrote a book, a beautiful book called The Embankment of Separation. Have you ever read that book, Gregor? No. You would love it. I mean, it's a, I'm not, I'm definitely not like recommending it to people as like a book to start with it's it's you know it's a rather esoteric book uh but very clear and so he said it's, it's called the embankment of separation and um in that book he explains that krishna's leela krishna's pastimes just like a river has two embankments and mm -hmm. it flows between the two so krishna's leela or krishna's pastimes is flowing between the, the embankment of separation and the embankment of union there's these two embankments and the river flows between the two. And so love for Krishna and Krishna's pastimes is flowing between union with Krishna and separation from Krishna. It's flowing between the two. It, it's, it's an esoteric idea, but it's a very beautiful, you mm -hmm. know, th this is part of what uh, you and I, you know, you know, people may say, well, why, why did you follow this particular spiritual tradition? And I think a lot of it has to do with the depth of of um of the detail of, of of how it will go how deep it can go into explaining what love of god is all about and so he wrote that you know that between union and separation krishna's leela is flowing that the devotee of krishna is going back and forth is flowing between union and separation the feeling and and, and that back and forth increases the depth of one's love in the in the the depth of the experience of that love that one has. And so here we're hearing that this is the beginning of the Bhagavatam, first canto. When we get to hear in depth about that separation and union is going to be in the 10th canto. Mm -hmm. But here there's a little something to give us an understanding of what's going to happen there, that Krishna is going to leave one place. He's going to arrive in another place. We're going to hear a bit about the feeling of separation, a bit about the feeling of union, and see how both of those experiences stimulate one's feelings and affection and love for god all right it's an amazing book yeah um all right so this is uh one ten one or first canto ch chapter 10 text one shanaka uh, 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 uh. no chapter 11 chapter 11 chapter 11 oh look all right you start again somehow it's... just scroll down to the bottom and then hit the next chapter okay i got it i got gotcha. you okay so this is Lord Krishna's entrance into Lord Krishna's Dwarka. entrance into Dwarka. Gotcha, gotcha. Sutta Goswami says so. Sutta Goswami is the head sage, leading thousands of other uh, liberated souls, not just like a ordinary man in the village. These people are all liberated souls. Sutta Goswami is the head, 
and he's in a forest called Naimai Sharanya. And um, he's giving a discourse right now. So we're back with this original narrator. Upon reaching the border of his most prosperous metropolis, known as the country of the Anart Anartas, also known as Dwarka, the Lord sounded his auspicious conch shell, heralding his arrival and apparently pacifying the dejection of the inhabitants. Yes, it's so it's interesting. Happy. Apparently, you know, it says dejection, but that dejection is that feeling of separation. It's mm. a transcendental dejection. That's, that's what you're. All right, that's what it meant by the parent. I dejection. believe so. I believe so. Okay. You want me to just go on? Yeah, I want you to read the next one. Okay. Um, the white and fat, bold conch shell, being gripped by the hand of Lord Krishna and sounded by him, appeared to be reddened by the touch of his transcendental lips. It seemed that a white swan was playing in the stems of the red lotus flowers. Wow. Want to read the commentary to that? The redness of a white conch shell due to the lip touch of the Lord is a symbol of spiritual significance. The Lord is all spirit, and matter is ignorance of this spiritual existence. Mm. Factually, there is nothing like matter in, this, in spiritual enlightenment. Factually, there is nothing like matter in spiritual enlightenment. And this spiritual enlightenment takes place at once by the contact of the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna. The Lord is present in every particle of all existence, and he can manifest his presence in anyone. By ardent love and devotional service to the Lord, or in other words, by spiritual contact with the Lord, everything becomes spiritually reddened like the conch shell in the grip of the Lord. And the Paramahamsas, or the supremely intelligent person, plays the part of the ducking swan in the water of spiritual bliss, eternally decorated by the lotus flower of the Lord's feet. That was very poetic. It was. It was beautiful. Let me think about that. You know, okay, you look, Krishna's blowing this conch shell, right? And somehow everything that he touches just becomes, transforms in some special, beautiful way. Um, so when his lips touch this conch, you know, conch shell is a beautiful thing, you know? Maybe everybody here hasn't yeah. held one in their hand. Or blown one. Or, or blown it's one. And the trumpets. Know? It's got that beautiful, rich sound. Um, but, you know, it's heavy and very pure white. You know, it's, it's rare that in nature something so purely white, you know, like that. Um, and then... Krishna blows it in and just by his lips touching it, it becomes, you know, it, it takes on that. It says when you touch Krishna, just like sometimes you touch someone's skin, the color changes, you know? Yeah. When you touch Krishna's skin, it, it really changes color, you know? And uh, right. when he touches that conch shell, the conch shell changes color. And it's so that in Prabhupada is saying that there's a spiritual significance to this, that um, the Lord is all spirit and matter is ignorance. Factually, there's nothing like matter in the spiritual enlightenment. And the spiritual enlightenment takes place at once by the contact of the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna. So, you know, that, that everything that comes in contact with Krishna becomes transformed. If our life can come in contact, it becomes reddened, it becomes enlivened, it becomes transformed, you know. If, if, our, if in our job, we can somehow connect the work that we do, it becomes transformed. The food that we prepare if it's prepared with devotion and offered, it becomes transformed. You know, um, even our own faces and, and you know, the, the, the way that, you know, it'll show, you know, we'll become happy, we'll become joyful. You can see when someone's enlivened with devotional service in their eyes and their face becomes transformed. You know, whatever comes into contact with that pure spiritual energy is transformed. Relationships. Relationships. Relationships, our, parent, our parenting, our, you know. Yeah everything becomes transformed by that contact. That's a big... The citizens of Dwarka, having heard that sound, which threatens fear personified in the material world, began to run towards him fast just to have a long desired audience with the Lord, who is the protector of all devotees. Yeah. It's the sound that threatens fear personified. Everything has a personification. That's what I like about this. Even fear has a personification. So that's 
having heard that sound, which threatens fear personified. And you could just, you know, you can picture the scene, you know, that the, all these devotees are feeling the separation from Krishna for some time and they hear that sound. And when, as soon as they hear that sound, what happens in their hearts? Krishna's back, you know? And they drop everything and they start to run. And when you hear the descriptions of the beauty of the people of Dwarka, you know, how beautiful they are, how beautiful they're dressed, you know, all these pure hearted souls. And then you can picture them, you know, in this very beautiful setting of Dwarka, and then they just start to run. You know, he's back, the excitement, you know? I'll, I'll dive in the purport a little bit. Okay. It's, it's really sweet. As already explained, the citizens of Dwarka who lived at the time of Lord Krishna's presence there were all liberated souls who were descended there along with the Lord as an entourage, not to be confused with the television show, Entourage. All were very anxious to have, that was so stupid. I don't even know that show, but okay. You're lucky. It was such a bad, it was such a <laughs> All were very anxious. Come on, Mary, you've seen Entourage. No, I have She has oh, not. Oh, you, you got, I'm with uh, Mary and St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> All were very anxious. I've barely seen it either. <laughs> I just thought you guys sure, would give me something sure. back. <laughs> oh. All were very anxious to have an audience with the Lord. Although because of spiritual contact, they were never separated from the Lord. Uh, just okay. as the Gopis of Vrindavan. Go on. Well, there you go. This, this, that, okay, re, re, let's read this, what he says right here. Read that sentence again in the next. All one. were very anxious to have the audience of the Lord. Although because of his spiritual contact, they were never separated from the Lord. Just as? Just as the gopis at Vrindavan, at Vrindavan used to think, that, think of Krishna while he was away from the village for cow herding engagements. The citizens of Dwarka were all immersed in thought of the Lord while he was away from Dwarka to attend the battle of Guru Kshetra. Okay, we gotta say something, brother. All right, all right, jump in. Actually, today is a holiday. Are you aware? Oh, wait a second. I always get the memo late. What's the holiday today? Oh, wait! Yeah. What's the date? All That's right. What I'm asking you. you. I don't know. What date, what's it? It's Sita's appearance day. Well, today's Sita's Divine appearance day. appearance of Sita Devi. Oh, man, I would have prepared something. Uh, well, okay. here, it, it came up on its own without you even preparing for it, right? What's, what's being said, it's just what we're talking about, that embankment of union, that embankment of separation. The depth of one's experience of Krishna is, is in both of them, right? And it's saying here that all, all of these residents of Dwarka, that Krishna's been away for a long time now. And they've been experiencing that separation. They were all very anxious to have an audience with him. But then Prabhupada points out, although because of spiritual contact, they were never separated from him. So although they were separated from him, they were not separated from him. Because mm -hmm. on the spiritual level, it's, it's all about the consciousness. And their consciousness was as absorbed in him or even more so in separation. So he, he says... He gives the example, just like the gopis of Vrindavan. They used to think of, because the gopis, of course, the intense separation in the Bhagavatam is when, the, is when Krishna leaves Vrindavan and the gopis are trying to hold back the chariot and they're throwing their bodies in front of the horses and they're doing all they can. But on a daily basis, Krishna goes off with the cows for the day and all the girls are just like, well, when are we going to see him again? When are we going to see him again? When are we going to see him again? And so they're feeling that union in separation. You know, they're feeling the, the depth of their absorption and thought of him is even deeper. And the experience of love is even deeper in separation. So he's, so Prabhupada gives the example of the, the gopis, the cowherd girls of Vrindavan. They used to think of Krishna while he was away from the village for cowherding engagements. Uh, and so the, the citizens of Dwarka were all immersed in thought of the Lord while he was away from Dwarka to attend the battle of Kurukshetra, which is the battle that takes place you know, that the Bhagavad Gita builds up to. So, um, you know, pr probably one of the most difficult things to understand in all of this uh, Vedic literature is the separation of Sita and Ram. 
True. Mm. Isn't it? Yeah, a little difficult. <laughs> I mean, don't no. you find people ask that question a lot? And yeah. So, you know, the, 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 throughout the whole Ramayana, we're hearing about Ram's intense love for Sita, you know, and all that he's willing to do to, to bring her back. Book. The whole book is about him trying to find Sita, yeah. walking all over the <laughs> subcontinent then, of India. Yeah, and then, and then when he, she's finally, you know, rescued and brought back, um, the, shortly thereafter, Ram sends her away, right? And it's kind of like, you know, it's interpreted in all kinds of ways and there's all, you know, all kind of thought about it, but it's only the people that are deep in this tradition that can explain it and can understand it, mm. you know? And, and, and on the esoteric level, it has to do with this, that, that, that actually the love is even deeper in separation. The experience is even deeper in separation. If you approach it from a mundane perspective, you're not gonna understand it. It can only be understood you know, through, through understanding rasa, through understanding, you know, and, and the great teachers of this can, can share how to understand it. So I just thought, hey, you know, here you go. It, this, here's a, a, a very interesting way Shri Prabhupada is explaining that here. When we are not with someone, it like wrecks her, it wrecks, if you're with someone that you love, you're deeply in love and that, belo and that beloved is gone, it, it's, it's crippling if you're attached to that person. In bhakti, to the degree that you're not, and we experience this too, just hearing you guys talk about Prikram in Vrindavan or in, in Mayapur or in, um, I was on the phone with a, a student friend of mine and we were talking about, oh, I want to go back to Vrindavan. I want to do this again. I want to bathe in the Ganges again. And in that like deep remembrance and appreciation, it's as if you're there. That is, that is sort of the, that's the goal as well as being there. Yes. to have that strong, deep appreciation for it in separation. It's different than material separation, which actually just causes a, a heartache, but in not a productive way. This mm. is sort of like a heartache that's actually bringing you higher. Can you say that's a reasonable statement? I think it's a very makes reasonable sense? statement. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's that the, the feeling of separation is such an intense one. And we can see that separation draws out such strong emotions in people, even the, the strongest of emotions in people. That's why there's like, so many songs about heartbreak and, you know, my baby left me and all of that kind of stuff. You know, it's like you really get deeply immersed in that emotion. So when that emotion is connected to God, then you go very deeply into your feelings uh, of God. You know, sometimes like those holidays, like the, like Prabhupada's appearance day is a special holiday, but his disappearance day, to me, somehow it's even more moving and isn't it? Yeah, the day the guru leaves. Yeah. Right. And, and they have that song, right? It's like you're crying through the whole song. Uh, it's, it's such, a, oh, it's such a heart-wrenching song, you know, about yeah. the, the, the intense feeling of separation that one feels uh, in the absence of the one that we they have. We have a Wisdom of the Sages retreat. We just get around, we sing songs, we right. eat Mara's cooking, we uh, read the Bhagavatam. Eat Mara's cooking. Maybe, 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 maybe You'll have to cook it, we'll just eat it. Play a little volleyball, <laughs> whatever it's, whatever. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think once things open back up, we gotta have a Wisdom of the Sages retreat thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep, keep going. going here. Next verse. Basically, our whole sadhana is trying to remember Krishna. It's trying to get to that longing. We're it's chanting awesome. our, we're chanting the Maha Mantra, we're, uh, right? Smarta vyasa tatam vishnor, vishvartam no vijatu chit. You know that verse? I don't. You even know what it is? No. Sarva vidi nishedasyor etiyor eva kinkara. No. Nope. It's all. It, always remember Krishna, never forget him. Smartavya Satatam Vishnu. Always remember Lord Vishnu or Krishna and never forget him. All the other rules and all the other regulations, all the other, everything that you do. They're meant to serve that rule. They're servants of, the, of that rule. Then you understand the meaning of, of all the practices. Hmm. You got that, Mara? Take note, Mara. <laughs> Jotting it down now. The citizens arrived before the Lord with the respective presentations, 
offering them to the to the fully satisfied and self-sufficient one who by his own potency incessantly supplies others here they are giving to krishna but he's the one that gives to everyone these presentations were like the offering of a lamp to the sun yet the citizens began to speak in ecstatic language to receive the lord just as wards welcome their guardian and father that's okay. beautiful yes yeah, so right, we do this yeah go on no you please I, well i was gonna say you know we go to the ganga sometimes and what do they do at the ganga the first after you bow down you take a handful of ganga water and you offer it in a circle to the ganga because in every altar all around india all around the world during the puja or the worship of the deity you offer incense you offer a lamp the dupe in the deep and then you offer ganga water or sacred water to the deity and now you're at the ganga and you're offering water to the ganga the question is why are you offering ganga water to the ganga the ganga's got enough water don't you think you think the ganga needs your water and the answer is the ganga doesn't need your water but the ganga wants to see the devotion so all the things that we're offering Krishna, Krishna doesn't need a banana. You're offering Krishna a banana? Come on. It's like, you think Krishna's got, Krishna's got plenty of bananas. Krishna wants to see our devotion, right? So if I'm just like, okay, offer this, this, right? Not impressed. He wants to see, okay. Like just yesterday, I was like, I was doing my morning puja. And I was like, all right, well, I don't have flowers and it's pouring rain outside. And um, I was like, okay, should I pick flowers or should I just mentally offer flowers? And I was like, okay, I got to go out there and pick the flowers. But in, in that thing of just going out, getting cold, you know, wearing a robe, whatever, in the, in the rain. And it's really, that's what Krishna wants to see. Krishna wants to see, are you, are you really into this? Not that Krishna needs any flowers for me. Krishna is in a spiritual realm. He just wants to see our devotion. And we're always getting asked at every moment. You have some devotion for me? He doesn't want to see you go through some ritual. You want to comment on my comment or you want to comment well, on the well, first question? I was going to comment some, but I see this is what Prabhupada mentions in the first sentence. It says the Supreme Lord Krishna is described here in as the word that was used in the verse is Atma Rama. Right? So Atma Rama means self-satisfied. Right? There's nothing external that he needs to be satisfied. He's already satisfied. He doesn't need whatever is offered. It's like offering a lamp to the sun. I, 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 let's read the comment. I think Prabhupada's going to get into it all right here. He'll say it better than we can. The Supreme Lord is described here in his Atmarama. He is self-sufficient, and there's no need to, for him to seek happiness from anything beyond himself. He is self-sufficient because he, he is very transcendental existence. Is to, his very transcendental existence is total bliss. He is eternally existent. He is all cognizant and all blissful. That's Therefore, Satchit Ananda right there, right? Satchit Ananda. Yeah. Therefore, any presentation, however valuable it may be, he's not, it is not needed by him. But still, because he is the well-wisher for one and all, he accepts from everyone um, everything that is offered to him in pure devotional service. It is not that he is in want for such things, because the things are themselves generated from his energy. It's pretty good. It's the compar all his. Go on. He, it, the, he makes the banana. That is his own energy. He's the banana. He makes bananas. <laughs> He's the banana maker. <laughs> the comparison is made here in that the making of offerings to the Lord is something like offering a lamp in the worship of the sun god. Anything fiery and illuminating is but an emanation of the energy of the sun. And yet to worship the sun God is necessary to offer him a lamp. In the worship of the sun, there is some sort of demand made by the worshiper. But in the case of devotional service of the Lord, there's no question of demand from either side. It is all a sign of pure love and affection between the Lord and his devotee. Okay, so that's an important point too. He's saying generally when people worship the God of the sun or the other devas, in general, it's being done because you you want something back right. it's not like it's a bad thing it's just sort of like you're appreciating that the these higher beings they can give stuff and we appreciate them so we want to we want to almost almost like a kid would say hey dad uh 
I'm going to wash your car for you. Do, do you mind if I borrow it tonight? It's like you're, 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 pay, you're, you're paying it to your father and you're hoping your father's going to give you a kickback. But it's different in Bhakti. Bhakti's different. So he says there, there's no question of demand from either side. It's just an expression of love. Yeah. I, I, never, I never quite picked that up in my childhood spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. I always treated uh, religion and going to church sort of as a metaphysical Amazon Prime. <laughs> I want this and I want this, I want this, and I want it now! <laughs> okay. He says, it is all a sign of pure love and affection between the Lord and the devotee. Yeah. Uh, keep reading or you want to just go? Yeah, I mean, we've got a few minutes left, so why don't we just finish this out? Yeah, I, I also want to mention, you know, we had a great talk with Vish, Vishambar. Vishambar is going to be our guest on Sunday's show. Yeah. And um, we're excited about him. Grew up, grew up chanting the holy name from childhood. His parents took him on Parikrama to holy places throughout India. It's such, so many good stories. He's the singer, the lead singer of the Mayapuris. And he's going to be our guest Sunday at 8 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. So please join us. Okay, let's read one more verse. Oh, uh, the citizen said, Oh Lord, you are worshipped by all the demigods like Brahma, the four sunnas, right? And even Kumaris the king face. of heaven. Is that huh? the Kumaris? The four sunnas is the Kumaris? I guess it's the it must be Sanat, Sanat. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah, the four sunnas. I never heard it explained like that. Yeah. And even the king of heaven, Indra, you are the ultimate rest for those who are really aspiring to achieve the highest benefit of life. You are the supreme transcendental Lord and inevitable time cannot exert its influence on you. Okay, so now we, again, prayers are being framed here and we're gonna hear a series of prayers this time from the residents of Dwarka. And they start off by saying that, uh, let's understand who he is, right? He's, he's not ordinary, he's, not, he's, he's, he's the tip top. He's worshiped by, even by Brahma. Even by the four Kumars, even by Indra, all the top people in the universe. It's not affected by time. That's a big one. Brahma is affected by time. Even Brahma. Even Brahma is affected by time. He's got the longest lifespan in the universe. He's still affected by time. You're not affected by time. Yeah. I'm affected by time. Are you? Yeah. How so? I don't notice. I looking at myself in the mirror. I was like, man, I'm affected by time. <laughs> <laughs> I've been affected by time. Time has been cruel. But Raghunath, you are not affected by time. Your body is affected. My body's by been affected by time. I've, I've started to notice. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, creator of the universe, you are our mother, our well-wisher, our Lord, our father, our spiritual master of all and, and worshipable deity. By following your footsteps, we have become successful in every respect. Isn't that true? You practice bhakti like that, you actually feel successful. Even if you have nothing, you feel like incredibly successful. We pray, therefore, that you continue to bless us with your mercy. You're a mother. You are well. What does it mean he's a mother? It means he nurtures us. Nurtures you, feeds you. Surit pati pati pita. <laughs> is, that, is that the Sanskrit? That's the part of the Sanskrit. The, the yeah. friend, the father. Friend, Suhrit is the friend. Right. Pati, the husband. Pita, pita the father. Yeah. M Mata, the mother. Sat hey, so, so if we can call ladies Prabhu, well, right here, there's a man being called Mata, right? So it seems to justify yeah. your... <laughs> there we go. People getting down on me for calling women Prabhu. It's a good sentiment. Oh, it is our good luck that we have come again today under your protection by your presence. For your lordship is rarely visits even the denizens of heaven. Now it is possible for us to look into your smiling face, which is full of affectionate glances. We can now see your transcendental form full of auspiciousness. Kosti, but check this out. It made an interesting point here. Yeah. Even in higher planets where there's so much sense gratification, heavens, there's demigods, there's liberated souls, even they don't see Krishna. Mm. 
they're almost like almost like living like the, the ultra wealthy of the, of Earth at one percent who are just like you know calling their yacht to land at a certain uh, location and their helicopter takes them down and they go around th- through the uh, South Seas or the you know Mediterranean and they get flown somewhere to some other exotic port. It, that the heavens are like this, the incredible, incredibly pleasurable, but still they don't get to see Krishna. And here these people in Dwarka are thinking, the demigods, the denizens of heaven, they don't get what we're having right now. Mm. You ever think like that? Ever think like that? Ever well, think like, if, it, it, <laughs> like I was thinking like that on that prick around Mayapur. I was thinking, I'm just like, a, I'm just like a loser. I'm 22 years old, hiking around India. And, and um, here I am. This is like the spiritual realm. I was like, don't people get it? Anybody could be here and there's just a few choosing it, right? There's just a few choosing it. It's for everybody and just take it. (laughs) Well, it's the, there's only one explanation. Cue up the music because this was, was this could be the- The good finale. Well, (laughs) I was gonna say there's only one explanation. And that is the unlimited mercy of Sri Chaitanya. That's what I'm feeling. All right. Well, all right, we did it again. Srimad Bhagavatam is like a boat carrying us across this long, deep, tre- potentially treacherous ocean of the material world. Grateful for all of you guys here today. Um, if you're new to this, welcome. Welcome to our little club. If you want to join our Zoom club, you can. You just have to jump through a few hoops first email mara at wisdom of the sages 108 at gmail.com and then we take with then we pinprick our fingers and hold them together and become blood brothers i'm no, just kidding i just added that um and uh she will give you the secret login code what the hell was that <laughs> that was really weird something just hit my house um Is that a bird? You're, you're, you're at a loss for words. <laughs> I'm lost on? for words. Something just hit my glass windows. Hey, like but the, the size person's... of a, a hawk or something. <laughs> anyway, on a side note, if t- tonight is Sweet Baby Krishna at 7, a- 7 p.m. Eastern Time, join us for Krishna Leela if you are a Patreon member. And if you like what we're doing, Wisdom of the Sages is community supported. So thanks for everyone who's contributing to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. And now we got to start dancing. I'm going to dance and try not to look out the window. What has hit our window? It might be laying potentially dead there. But I'm going to chant for this. Everybody listening on Apple Podcasts, make sure you go there now. If you haven't done this, give us a five-star review. It keeps us in the podcast world conversation. And welcome Arne. Shira.